Uh, the word God given to us this morning is from the book of 1 Thessalonians. It's very difficult to pronounce. Thessalonians, <laughs> chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that has that He has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we live among you for your sake. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you this morning that you are giving us your word. Help us to open our ears and open our hearts to hear your word, to understand your word, and to live your word, Lord. I pray in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now, who knows what marathon is? Marathon. The race. Yeah, that's right. It's the long-distance race, isn't it? So it's a long-distance race with an official distance of, who knows what the distance is? 40, 52, 50 50 no, sorry. <laughs> so, so it's 42.195 kilometers. So it's, it's quite a long distance, 42 kilometers, right? So if you're driving, it's a distance where it's going to take more than an hour to, to sort of complete that. So it's a quite a long race. Now, who knows the origin of marathon? Where did that name come from? I think that Daniel has, you know, explained this a number of times, so I'm just testing you, especially the young adults. <laughs> so the name Marathon comes from the legend of Philippides. It's a, it's a name of guy. He was the Greek messenger. So there was a battle between the Persians and the Greeks, and apparently that in that battle, the Persians outnumbered the Greeks by at least, you know, by double. So it was a very difficult battle for the Greeks. But surprisingly, the Greeks have actually won that battle, and the battle was at a place called Marathon. So, this guy, Philippides, he was the messenger. He wanted to convey the message, bring it back home to the Greeks at home. So, what he did was he actually ran without stopping. He ran without stopping for about 40 kilometers. And once he got to where he needed to be, he burst out into the assembly saying, We have won! And he collapsed and died after running 40 k's. So it sort of became famous and sort of the name sort of became sort of the, the race to sort of, you know, appreciate the actual legend. Now, the average finish time to complete that 40 odd kilometers in a race, it normally takes about four hours and 29 minutes. So that's the, the official record. So that's the average time that a race, you know, starts that that's people sort of, you know, Take the time they've taken for you know people to actually finish the race. Now there's a world record held by a guy in Kenya. I can't pronounce his name, so I'll just say a guy in Kenya. So the world record time is two hours and one minute and thirty nine seconds. And guess what? The second world record is two seconds later than this guy. So it's a very sort of you know close record. So you know this guy ran. The entire 42 kilometers in two hours. That's very really impressive. Right? Now, I'll tell you a story. There were two marathon fanatics who really love you know, the game of marathon. So these two guys, there are two interesting facts about these two fanatics. They attended almost all marathon races around the world. There's so many races around the world, and these guys, these two people have actually attended most of the races. And what they do is, they finish all the races. They, they start to the finish, you know, they finish, complete the race. But what's interesting about them is that they always come last 
and second rounds. So these two people would go to every single race around the world and they'll finish and they'll always come last and second last. Now, they attended the famous New York Marathon. New York Marathon is, is quite a famous one. And New York Marathon is based for those people, you know, the people watching. And they actually just try to distract the race as much as possible. So some people from the crowd are actually offer the people who's racing alcohol, you know, food. And also some people would actually offer cigarettes as well so that, you know, the people would actually give up on the race. So these two guys who are running the New York Marathon, despite all these temptations, you know, they were very close to the final, sort of, you know, the finish line. And of, of course, they were the last and the second last in that race as well. So they were very close and they were about 20 meters away from the finishing line. And the one who always comes second last turns around to the one who always comes last and says this, hey man, you always come last. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? How does it feel to come last, man? It's, it's a very humiliating comment. So after hearing this, the guy who's always coming last, who was very upset, was very upset. And he thought about it, and this is what he said. <coughs> well, you'll still find out. I quit, and he gave up and he left the race. <coughs> now, today's sermon is about not so much the race, but getting to the finish line, finishing the race. Now, let's go back to today's passage, the letter to the church of Thessalonians. So, this is a new book that we're studying, so I'm, I'm so <coughs> glad that we finished Titus. So now we moved on to a new book. So you probably know that Paul, Apostle Paul, has written so many books in the New Testament. So out of 27 books in the New Testament, Paul wrote 13 of them. And they're all letters, letters to churches. So this is one of the letters that's written by Paul to the church in Thessalonia, or Thessalonica, or Thessaloniki, so the you know different sort of permutations of the name. Now, what's unique about this is that this is the very first letter that's written by Paul, sent to the church. So this was written well before the Ephesians and you know Timothy and Romans and Monster Heavy. So this is the very first letter. So that's what's so special about it. Now, the play Thessalonia, Thessalonia, even though it's very hard to pronounce. It's, it's a harbour city located in the northern side of Greece. So it's on the Greek side, not the Italy side. So it's on the, the Macedonian side. And this city was found by a Macedonian general, Cassander, who named it after his wife, Thessaloniki. So the name actually came from his wife's name. So, and the city actually exists today as well. So this is one of the cities where it still exists today. And it was the biggest city in Macedonia. And because of the size of the city, you know, what happens when the size of the city is actually big and it's cosmopolitan, right? Then it also becomes very corrupt spiritually. So that's what happened in the city. The city was spiritually so corrupt. Now the city, it was a city of polytheists, those who believe in more than one God. Many, many gods. You know, they believed in so many different gods. For example, they believe in the god of Dionysus, so they call it the Dionysus cult, and what it's a god of fertility and reproduction. So what that meant was that they were very sexually corrupt. Those who believed in that god, they were very sexually corrupt. And also, they also believed in what you call the Caribius, Caribius cult. So it was actually, Caribius appears in a myth in Thessalonia. So when Caribius died, his brothers buried him in the mountains in Thessalonia, and it was believed that Caribius will come back again alive when the city is in danger. So it's like the Messiah coming back to life and save the city. So they actually believed that, that Caribius would actually save the city when they're in danger. Now also, this city was very, very much loyal to the Roman Empire. So they almost worshipped Caesar as their god. So that's how much role there were. The people living in that city, they were quite loyal to the Roman Empire. Now in that city, there's this church, church in Thessalonia. 
Now, how did it come about? Who established this church? When Paul was on his second mission trip, he visited Thessalonia alongside with Silas and Timothy. And they preached in the synagogues. And also they preached the gospel to the people in Thessalonia. And once the good news was preached, then there were people who accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord in Thessalonia. Now, the Jews and Gentiles, they heard the news and they believed. And among those who believed, there was a man called Jason. There's no name by Jason here, right? It's a good name. Jason. Jason. So, you know, this guy Jason, actually everyone who actually believed, who became Christian, they actually gathered at Jason's house. And later, that gathering became the church in Thessalonia. So they started meeting in, at his home. And then that sort of became the church. Now, everywhere that Paul went, we know that there were people who liked Paul, right? But also, in quite the opposite, there were people who really hated Paul, who, you know, really opposed Paul. So there were people very, very aggressive and hostile against Paul in Thessalonians as well. And these people were not the Gentiles, not the Romans, but these people were the Jews, the same race as Paul. So they were the traditional Jews. You know, those who believed in the Jewish tradition, those who believed in the law and who actually abided by the law, and those people who rejected Jesus Christ as their Saviour or Messiah, they just couldn't accept the Gospel. And they ignored the teaching of Paul. And they really became jealous after you know, people getting converted into Christianity. And what they did was they conspired to get rid of Paul and Timothy and Silas, to get them out of the city. So that's what they sort of planned. Now we see from Acts chapter 17 that these Jews living in Thessalonia, what they did was they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. So the bad characters, you know, like your hand, right? The bad characters in the marketplace. And they formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They started a riot. And then what they did was they then, with a group, big group of, you know, bad characters, they actually rushed to Jason's house in search for Paul and Silas in order to bring them out of the crowd and kick them out of the city. But when they went to Jason's house, Paul and Silas weren't there. So instead what they did was, well, instead, you're responsible. So they took Jason and others who were at the house and they brought them before the city officials. And this is what they said. These men have caused trouble all over the world and have now come here. And this guy, Jason, welcomed them into his house. You know what? They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is not another king. One called Jesus. They're calling Jesus their own king. So this is what they claim. Now, this is quite ridiculous, isn't it? But this is a quite serious accusation. Because during the time of Roman Empire, people were only allowed to call Caesar as their lord. We know that, right? So they could only call Caesar as their lord. But what did the Christians do? Once they accepted Jesus Christ as their saviour, they now call Jesus as their Lord. So there's a conflict here. And from the worldly perspective, from the Roman Empire's perspective, this is treason. It's a direct breach of Caesar's decree. Now, the Jews, then what about the traditional Jews? They didn't really care about the Roman Empire, did they? I mean, they didn't even appreciate the Romans. But what they did was they actually took advantage of the decree to get rid of Paul and Silas and Timothy in order to satisfy their needs or what they want. So they just took advantage of it. And when the city officials heard about this, they were thrown into turmoil. What? Really? Are they serious? So they didn't know what to do. So how do we, how do we deal with this? You know, you're not meant to say this, but they're actually saying it. So how do we do this? And what if the high officials find out? You know, would I lose my job? So I think they went into turmoil because of that reason. So what they did at the end of the day, they made Jason and others to pay a bond, so, you know, pay money as in security, and they released them. So that's what happened in, in chapter 17 of um, Acts. Now, was it the end of it? Maybe not. 
So after that incident, you know, there would have been continuous persecution against the Christians in Thessalonia. Now, after leaving Thessalonia, Paul tried to visit Thessalonia again, but he couldn't. He couldn't go back. So instead, he sent Timothy in his place to go and visit Thessalonia and, you know, to find out what they're doing and how they're doing. So Tim actually went to Thessalonia. He went back to Thessalonia. And after, you know, finding out what's happening in Thessalonia, he brought the news back to Paul. And now Paul is, after hearing the news about Thessalonia, he's quite excited, you know. He's quite sort of, you know, pleased to hear all the good things that the Thessalonian Christians are doing. So at the moment, this is how he actually is writing the letter after hearing about Thessalonia from Timothy. Now, first part of the letter, first part of the letter we have read, includes three things. And it's very similar to the letter that we write in this day and age as well. So you've got the, the sender, right? You need to know who the sender is. You've got the recipient, who is that addressed to. And also you've got the typical greeting, right? So the, the typical greeting words. Now, first of all, let's, have, let's go back to verse 1 first. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Now, question to you, who's the sender, who's the recipient, what's the greeting? It's quite obvious from that verse, isn't it? So the sender, sender is Paul, Silas, and Timothy. But did they all sort of get together and write this letter? Maybe not. Maybe it was Paul writing the letter. But the reason that you've got Silas and Timothy is because they were the ones who originally went on that trip and established the church in Thessalonia. So they're sort of putting everyone's name in that letter. Now, recipient. The church of the Thessalonians. Right? To the church of the Thessalonians. Is there anything unique about this? to the church of the Thessalonians. Now, it's interesting that Paul doesn't say the church in Thessalonia. Instead, he says the church of the Thessalonians. There's a subtle difference here. So, for example, it's like saying church of Chester Hill versus church in Chester Hill. What's the difference? Now, church in Chester Hill, it actually focuses on the place, the church in Chester Hill. But if you say Church of Chester Hill, it focuses on the people, the people, the gathering, right? So Paul is more interested in the people, not the place. And he's focusing on each person that he met in Thessalonia, the people who actually came to receive the good news, you know, who became really excited to hear about the gospel and who really turned away from their old ways and, and you know, received... Christ is their Lord. And even though Paul could only stay there for a short period of time, but now they're away from each other, but, but Paul might have visualized the face of those people, the Christians in Thessalonia, you know, while he was actually writing this letter. The church of Thessalonians. This is what Paul is saying. We can sense Paul's deep sense of affection towards them as we read this letter. He has a deep sense of affection towards these Christians. It says, To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is making it very clear about their spiritual identity as well in this statement. Now, the, their spiritual identity is that they are in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, in God and in Christ. And this is very different to the world, isn't it? They're set apart from the world. And they're under God's protection. They're in God. And there are, they are in His love. They're in Christ. They are in His grace. They're in Christ. And there are, they are in His peace. And they are in His plan of salvation. In God and in Christ, they are Christians. This is what Paul is alerting to them. As Christians. And then there's the greeting. Paul says, Grace and peace to you. Grace and peace be with you. Amen. 
Usually when people say greetings, they will say greetings, don't they? In their letter, greetings. And that's about it, right? But what Paul makes this special is that he makes it by saying, grace and peace be with you. You know, very Christian way. Grace and peace be with you. Now, then Paul goes on to talk about what he remembers about the Christians in Thessalonica. In verse 3, it says this, we continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we see very sort of you know, usual words here, right? The common words, faith, love, and hope. Faith, faith hope, and love. We, we, it's very common to us, isn't it? From the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, isn't it? Faith, love and hope. Right? And we also see this in this you know, beginning of this letter to the Thessalonians. Now, Paul is remembering the faith and the love and the hope of the Christians in Thessalonia. And what are they? What, what's so special about their faith? What's so special about their love? And what's so special about their hope? Now, in terms of their faith, they had an active faith, faith in their real day-to-day -day lives. So they demonstrate that faith in their day-to-day -day lives. And second, they had a love of labour, doing something, helping you know, people. So it was the action, it was the doing, it's the labour of love. Now true love is not just words, but it's actually showing actions, it's actually doing something, isn't it? That's what we call love. When the church was under persecution in Thessalonia, Christians had their wealth confiscated and they were exiled from the city. You know, some actually feared and didn't know what to do because they just, just, they just received the, the word and then you know, they became, they confessed that you know, they became Christian, but they didn't know what to do, right? But they, the group, didn't actually ignore the fellow Christians who are undergoing persecution, who are actually going through difficult times. And they helped them in every way they could. They didn't ignore other brothers and sisters in Christ, but they did something to help them. So it was a labour of love. Now, I, the hope, this is the part that I wanted to emphasise this morning. And they endured with the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we say endure, it's not just enduring momentarily to avoid the imminent danger or trouble. So it's not just you know, giving a, a good sort of excuse to just get out of their situation. That wasn't what they're talking about here. It's about endurance. It's about the steadfastness, not moved by the persecution. Whatever the persecution may be, they will endure. I will not move. And that was the endurance of these Christians. Now, Steadfastness is rooted in the hope. There's got to be an element of hope. You can't just have steadfastness without hope. And that hope is in our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who died for our sins. Jesus Christ who rose again from the dead. And Jesus Christ who will come again. They had a solid hope in Jesus Christ. And that's how they could endure all the persecutions and hardships. Now, we live in a day and age where evil, the level of evil has reached its highest. You look around and there's people ignoring God completely. You know, there's more laws and acceptance which we don't accept from our Christianity perspective. There's more and more things that's actually becoming more hostile to the Christians in our day-to-day -day lives. But also... Because of that change, if you think about right now in your daily life, you don't get any direct persecution by having to believe in Jesus Christ, by having to live as a Christian. There's no direct consequences that you will have to cope with. But it was different for the Christians in Thessalonica. They haven't believed for long. They heard the news and then they decided that, yes, I'll commit my life to our Lord Jesus Christ. And then once that's happened, they didn't have any time to prepare mentally 
And then he was smacked bang in your face. You know, now the persecution starts. Whoa, what's happening in my life? Have I made a wrong decision? This is what happened to these Christians in Thessalonica. They didn't have one or two years of Bible study and you know get together and getting you know ready for the persecution to come. But it happened from day one. Once they believed, and there were the persecution right away in their lives. Now, the Jews, the traditional Jews, continually slandered and accused the Christians. Now, the city officials, what did they do? They probably looked at them unfavorably. They didn't like them because they were trouble. They were troublemakers. And they would hear more bad words or bad news instead of good news every day. Someone getting hurt because they were Christian. Someone, you know, getting disadvantaged because of, you know, being Christian. So there were all this bad news spreading around. Bad morale. And then, you know, you will hear that someone's house or someone's belonging has been completely confiscated because they were Christian. You know, some would actually lose their job because they were Christians. Someone would actually get convicted, criminal convictions, because they called Jesus as their Lord. So this is quite serious. So the Christians in Thessalonia, they lived in fear and tears. Fear and tears. But what did they do? They didn't give up. They endured in the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul says. We remember before our God the Father. Now, if Paul remembers this, if Paul remembers that the Christians in Thessalonica have endured in the hope of their Lord Jesus Christ, that God the Father knows this, and He also remembers them. That's most important. Now, in verse 4, it says, We know that He, God, has chosen you. So, Paul makes a quite a bold statement about the Christians in Thessalonica. We know that God has chosen you. We know that God has chosen you. We know that God has chosen you. That's what Paul is saying here. Now, if you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, God chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Amen. Now, we, all, we often ask, we often ask this question, do you know if he or she is saved? Aren't you curious? What about me? Do you think I'm saved? We, we tend to ask a question to one another, don't we? I think you're saved because I think because you seem quite good. I don't think you're saved because because you're pregnant. So <laughs> we make this statement, don't we? Now let's have a look at um, two Timothy chapter two verse nineteen. It says, "The Lord knows those who are His." Amen. The Lord knows who are His. Which means that salvation ultimately belongs to God. And His choosing is something that is sovereign to Him. Only God knows. And He knows the people that He's chosen. But why did then Paul say that He knows that God has chosen the Christians in Thessalonica? Paul would definitely know this. But why did Paul say that He knows that the Christians in Thessalonica are the ones who are chosen by God. That's because God's election, His act of choosing, is done according to His perfect plan. So that's done way before. But this is the doing of the work. So the people who has been chosen, it's the work of the Holy Spirit who will identify those people who are chosen. And the work of the Holy Spirit can be seen by its fruits. So it will be revealed in their fruits. And that's how you know. Their work produced by faith. Their labor prompted by love. And their endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It was very, very evident that Paul was convinced that they were chosen by God because of the fruits that were shown. Because of their faith, because of their love, because of their hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. He couldn't say that he didn't know, because it was quite evident. Now, then what about us? What about 
you and me, this congregation, this church, we also believe that we're chosen by God, don't we? And that's why we're here this morning, worshiping our God. Now, as others see our work, that is produced by faith, our work produced by faith. And as others see our labor, that's prompted by love. And as the others see our steadfastness as we endure in the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ, then also others will say that we know that the church in Chester Hill is chosen by God. People will say that. If we do the work of faith, if we labor in the love, and also if we hold on to the hope and endure, then others will say the same to this church. Now, who likes boxing? Boxing was before MMA sort of, you know, was introduced. Boxing was probably the most, you know, sort of brutal game that sort of existed. So some people don't like it, some people like it, but it's quite manly sport, right? So boxing was quite popular in the 70s and 80s. Now, one of the biggest boxing matches of the 20th century took place on November the 25th, 1980. 1980, so well before a lot of you were born. So 1980, at the Superdome in New Orleans, in Louisiana. So there was a big match there. And it was a rematch. So it was a rematch between a guy called Sugar Ray Leonard and Roberto Duran. Roberto Duran. Roberto Duran was the, the champion. And the Sugar Ray Leonard was actually contending for his, for his championship. Now, Duran, Roberto Duran had won the previous fight. And he was the favorite for the second time round as well. So he was a really good boxer. Roberto Duran, um, who was from Panama, he was actually a good, very good boxer. And he had a record of 72 wins and just one loss. So he won 72 fights and just you know one loss. And he had won the last 41 fights consecutively. So he was won 41 fights. And this is very, very impressive record. And, and the rematch was a very close fight. Only a point or two you know, separated between the two fighters on the judges' scorecard. So it was a very close match because the... The, the Sugar Ray Lennon had actually prepared for this fight after he lost the first game. He really sort of, you know, studied and actually trained hard in order to beat uh, Roberto Duran on the second game. So it was a very, you know, close match. But something that's unthinkable happened in the eighth round that no one expected. No one expected on the eighth round. Roberto Duran turned to the referee and spoke two words, no mas, which means no more, no mas, and he just quit. Everyone was shocked. He wasn't injured. He wasn't cut. There's nothing wrong with him, but he seemed very frustrated and he just couldn't stand it anymore. And this is a fighter who was one of the best in the world stepping into the ring. And he just quit on the eighth round. And everyone's so shocked. Now, when Roberto Duran was retiring, he had a record of total win of 103 fights, which is a very impressive record. Now, but when anyone mentions of his name today, Roberto Duran, and if you know about boxing, the first thing that comes to your mind is no mas, no more. And people remember the day that he quit. Now we've had the same things happening in our life. You know, we are challenged every day. We want to quit as well. We want to quit our job. I want to quit my job. <laughs> we want to quit our school. Do you want to go to school? <laughs> Now, looking back, I didn't want to go to school. Now, sometimes we want to quit on our marriage, not me. But... <laughs> <laughs> and we want to quit on coming to church. Ah, oh, Sunday, I'm so tired. Maybe just, you know, skip one Sunday. Won't really matter. We want to quit. And I'm sure those 
Christians in Thessalonica felt the same. They just received the gospel. They just became Christians and they're getting persecuted day and night. Wow, this is just too much to bear. I, I think I need to quit. Because of Jesus Christ, the Jews, the traditional Jews, who are once like brothers and sisters, because they're from the same race, they might have hung out together. But once they became Christians, they turned their back against them and they started to persecute them. Because of Jesus Christ, their families turned their back on them. Because of Jesus Christ, they lost their jobs, they lost their belongings, they lost their houses, they were kicked out of their city. But they didn't quit because of Jesus Christ, because of their reason. Now, brothers and sisters, I command you to endure, to be steadfast in our daily lives. It is very difficult to keep up, isn't it? It's very difficult to keep up with everything that's happening in our lives. But don't quit. It seems that it's getting worse and I don't see any future in my life. What's there out there in my life? You know, what's going to happen? I've got this big uncertainty. But don't quit. Are you finding it hard to control your anger? Because that's for me. For me, it's very difficult to control my anger. Or do you feel that you don't have too much to thank for in your life? You know, I used to be you know, thankful for a lot of things, but nowadays it's very difficult for me to think about or think about anything. I don't appreciate as much as I used to. But you know what? You don't quit because of that. We endure in Jesus Christ because we still have hope. Even though you may seem that is uncertain, we still have hope in Jesus Christ. Because for one thing, what's certain in our lives is that Jesus Christ is coming back. And on that day, you'll be glorified with Him. As Paul says to the Christians in Thessalonica, grace and peace to you, every one of you who will endure in Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we want to live as you told us to live, Lord. We want to live as Christians, different to the world, set apart from the world, live according to your word, Lord. When we come to difficult situations in our lives, we struggle, we worry, and we fear about the uncertainties in our lives. So help us, Lord, to endure. Help us to rely on the hope of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to remember your amazing grace every day of our lives. Help us not to fail in remembering your word. Help us to do good so that the world may see that we are different, that we are Christians. We belong to you, Lord. So help us to be led by your Holy Spirit, to become one step closer to your holiness. Would you protect us from the evil one as we wait for your blessed hope, the glorious appearing of your Son, Jesus Christ. We praise in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.